Hello, welcome to the pre-op spine class. My name is Pam Aris and I'm a clinical bedside nurse on Nine Silver, which is the top floor of this neuroscience center. And that is the floor where most of our patients go after having spine surgery. The purpose of this class is to kind of help you know what to expect from the minute that you step in the hospital for surgery and also uh, what to expect during your stay and more importantly, uh, things to do and what to expect after you go home to help make your recovery um, the easiest for you and so that you have the best possible outcome for your surgery. So we'll get started on class here. This is a, an agenda of what we'll be talking about, some of the topics. Before your surgery, for pre-admission testing, your physician will require a variety of preoperative tests that may include a physical exam, an EKG, blood work, urinalysis, a chest x-ray, a nasal swab, and the nasal swab may be done at the surgeon's office even before you go for the pre-admission testing, and a pregnancy test if applicable. During your pre-admission testing, your physician will talk with you about which medications you should take um, the morning before you come in for surgery. And examples of those two medications are heart medications and blood pressure medications. So they will be very specific with you, and we also encourage you to talk with your physician about which medications you should avoid. Examples of those would be blood thinners, um, aspirin, Plavix, Coumadin, Xeralto, Plavix, Eliquis. They typically hold those um, for usually 10 to 14 days before surgery. Non-steroidals, they also want you to stop taking, and examples of those would be Naproxen, Motrin, Ibuprofen, Advil, um, Aleve, Mobic. They typically will stop like your vitamins and your herbal supplements, and also um, omega-3 fish oils. If you have migraines and take a medication other than Imitrex, uh, we encourage you to bring that in the original prescription bottle. Um, the hospital, if you have migraines, um, typically we, the doctors would order Imitrex and that may or may not help you. So if you have the medication that you normally take that's helpful for migraines, uh, we can send that to the pharmacy and the pharmacist just verifies that that is that medication and they'll put a barcode on the bottle and we get an order from the surgeon that this is the medication, your medication for your migraines we can use while you're here. So the day before surgery, unless your surgery is on a Monday, um, you will receive a call from um, the surgery scheduling office that will let you know what time your surgery is. Uh, for example, they may say that your surgery is at 9.30 in the morning the next day, and they want you to show up at 7 or 7.30 in the morning. Um, typically, it's two to two and a half hours before your surgery that they want you to come because there's um, like steps kind of a checklist that, that we go over with you. They'll remind you nothing to eat or drink after midnight and pack only the necessities to bring with you. Um, there is a safe available in the room, in each, in each patient room, and it's nice if you have a laptop or like an iPad, cell phone, a big purse, um, that you can secure your valuables in that safe while you're here. The surgery scheduling department will call you. I typically tell people, um, if you do not hear from them by three o'clock the day before surgery, to call your surgeon's office just to check to see what time your surgery is. Arrange for help, that is a big thing um, before surgery. There are many things you can do before surgery to make your recovery easier and safer. Preparing your home before surgery creates less work for you and your family, and it just makes your discharge process so much smoother and makes it easier for you for your recovery. Uh, most surgeons will tell you you're not able to drive for at least two weeks after surgery, so you'll need a friend or a family member to assist you with um, running to the grocery store, um, running errands, taking you to follow up doctor's appointments, pharmacy, what have you. We recommend that you have someone stay with you for at least the first 24 hours, and that's just to kind of help um, move things around in your home, kind of troubleshoot to make things easier for you um, for your recovery. So as we had talked about, you'll need help with transportation to and from the hospital, to the grocery and pharmacy, running any errands or shopping, 
help with cooking and cleaning. And um, one thing that's helpful is if you pre-plan or if you have frozen meals or can prepare simple meals or if friends or family offer to bring in food, take them up on the offer. Laundry becomes difficult with spine precautions and you will need help caring for your pets. An example of that is the surgeons typically don't want you trying to walk your dog if you've got like a big golden retriever or something. Um, if you take them for a walk, they may see another dog that they want to go talk to, say hi to, or a squirrel, and they might take off, and that wouldn't be good for you after surgery. Also, cleaning up after your pet and refreshing the food and water dishes. Stairs, typically, they try to limit those to once a day um, just to help avoid fatigue. So if there's any way possible that you can stay on the first floor during the day, they recommend that you come down in the morning as long as you've got like a half bath on the first floor and a place where you can rest throughout the day and then go back up at night just to kind of help, you know, eliminate some extra fatigue on your part. They will also check to see if you have stairs in your home. So if you have stairs even to enter your home or let's say your bedroom's on the second floor, they'll actually practice stairs with you before your discharge to make sure that you're able to do those safely. And if you have friends and family here, they like them to actually participate in the therapy session so they feel comfortable helping you get up and down stairs. Some patients may need to make arrangements to stay on only one level. And this may require moving a bed, having someone help you move a bed before you come in for surgery to the first floor and, um, and or using a bedside commode. There's many things you can do to reduce your risk of falling. Some examples of that are removing throw rugs, make sure all pathways are clear within your home, remove any hazards in the home that you could trip over, wear shoes or slippers with non-skid soles, and we discourage Crocs or flip-flops because they tend to catch on the carpet and may propel you forward, which wouldn't be good after surgery. Have family or friends available to assist you once home. And then the physical and occupational therapist can further discuss any safety concerns that you have prior to discharge. If you've got a specific question about like a real comfy recliner, if, if that's a good place to sit or what types of chairs would be best to sit in for home. So the day of surgery, they'll ask you to bring the following, a photo ID such as a driver's license, an insurance card, a form of payment if needed, and that would be if you had a copay or something, and they would let you know that ahead of time before you came in. A list of medications, and this is helpful to have for your pre-admission testing, and what we tell you to put on that is a, uh, a list of the medicines that you take, so the name of the drug, the dosage, how often you take it, and when you took it last. This list is helpful to bring the day of surgery to, uh, because they will go over that in the pre-op holding area with you they'll kind of review that list with you. If you are on a research drug or an investigational drug, we ask that you include that as well. And we recommend that you have the family bring that in in the original prescription bottle with any uh, paperwork that you have on it. So the surgeon can you know, review it and see if it's okay to continue that while you're here. Also include on that list any over-the-counter medications that you take, um, Pepsid, what have you might be an example of that, or any non-prescription medications. So when you check in at procedural family waiting, um, it's a reception desk that's on the first floor, just a little bit past Starbucks here. Um, you will meet a communication liaison. They will collect the cell phone number of family or friends um, so they can be updated after your surgery. If they do not have a cell phone, um, they can give your family or friends a pager so they're able to go to the cafeteria or to the gift shop. Also, they will receive a card with a number on it. And this is for HIPAA for privacy. Um, it's a long number. There are flat screen TVs that are located in the surgery family waiting area, which is across from the procedural family waiting reception desk where you check in for surgery. That's where friends and family can wait while you're in surgery. So they can actually track with that number on that card um, where you are in the process for surgery. And once your surgery is complete, um, the staff there will get you um, set up in a conference room, your friends or family, so that the surgeon can come in and discuss 
you know, how your surgery went, how you're doing, and answer any questions that they may have. So after you get checked in at the procedural family waiting area, they'll take you up to the pre-op holding area, which is on the second floor of the silver tower. Everything's done in this tower, which is nice. They'll make sure you've signed a consent for the surgery, start an IV, check your vital signs, review your health history, and also your medication list again. Testing, this may be, let's say during pre-admission testing, your potassium level was a little bit low, and the surgeon wants them to recheck that before surgery. Um, they can do any last minute testing in that area. You'll meet with the anesthesiologist, and it's helpful if you've had issues with anesthesia before. For example, um, some patients have trouble with nausea and vomiting after anesthetic. It is very helpful to let them know ahead of time because they can give you certain medications um, to make things easier for you after surgery. Some patients do have trouble, um, for example, I have trouble with difficult intubation, and so it's helpful if you've had problems in the past to let the anesthesiologist know so that it's just so much easier for you and for them. And then you'll meet with your surgeon in the pre-op area and they'll go over um, any last minute questions, also let your family know about how long surgery will be. They'll take you to the operating room for your surgical procedure once all of the pre-op tasks are complete and send your family back down to the surgery family waiting area on the first floor of the silver tower. After surgery, you will be taken to an area that's called the post-anesthesia care unit, or we abbreviate it PACU. It's the recovery room. You will be monitored closely by a nurse. Typically, it's like a one-to-one -one ratio or one-to-two. The nurse is right there as you're recovering from surgery. Vital signs will be taken frequently. Um, they'll hook you up to a heart monitor, which is the example in this picture here. They'll put um, little sticky stickers on your chest to monitor your heart rate and rhythm. They may poke your finger for a drop of blood, and that's to check your blood sugar. And the reason why we do that is if your blood sugar is elevated and not in a good control, it puts you more at risk for infection. So that's one of the things that we do to reduce your risk for infection. You may have a Foley catheter, which is this picture. It's a tube in your bladder so that when you urinate, um, it goes in into that catheter bag. The recovery room nurse or PACU nurse will call report up to the spine center to the nurse that's going to receive you up there and she'll say, um, this is Pam and Dr. Bay did this surgery and kind of give us a head-to-toe assessment so we'll know a lot about you before you even get up to the floor which is nice and it ensures easy transition of care which is very important. The procedural family waiting area staff will call you and let you know when um, they're getting ready to send your, you up to your room. And I usually tell people that um, don't be alarmed if you get up to the room. Usually the family arrives first before the patient, so it won't be long after you get there that usually the patient's coming. At Ohio Health, we have different colors for the different disciplines. and. Um, this is just an example of some of the staff that you might see. The registered nurses are in a navy blue, and we all have these little hang tags that have RN on them. The patient support assistant, or PSA, that's uh, the tech, they wear a lighter seal blue color. Lab is in an appropriate blood red, so if someone comes in your room and they have bright red on, they're there for blood. Um, rehab services, they wear like a burgundy color. That's your physical, occupational, and um, speech therapist. Housekeeping is in a tan top and like brown pants, and they'll be cleaning your room um, and restroom while you're there. Patient transport, the doctor may order a routine post-operative x-ray the next morning after surgery or while you're here in the hospital, and the person that may take you to that Post-op x-ray is a transport person and they wear a light gray top, darker gray pants. Uh, respiratory therapy is in the dark green up at the top there. Pharmacy, they typically bring us like a 24-hour supply of your medications and there's like a little box in your room that they uh, would stock every morning. Typically it's fairly early so you may see them, they're in a teal color. Anyone that comes in your room uh, will basically introduce themselves and they will tell you um, who they are, why they're there. 
So, in dietary, the people that bring your food, um, they used to wear this bright neon green. And since we moved over here to the new tower, they decided all black. I guess that's what fancy restaurants do. So, but our food may not be like fancy restaurants. <laughs> so these are typically the ones that you'll see. If you have, um, I'm trying to think. That's basically the colors that you'll see. But just know that anyone that comes in your room will always introduce themselves and we all have our badges on. So this is an example of what our rooms look like. They are really nice. That couch that's in the room turns into a bed. So if you have a friend or family member that wants to stay with you while you're here, they're welcome to stay. Uh, the hospital bed. And then you'll see the heart monitor is kind of close to the bed. Um, this is the closet. And in that closet is where that safe was that I was telling you about where you can secure your valuables. This is like a big dry erase board and we call it a communication board. And we use that a lot. And I actually have an example of it. Um, on that board it's got the date, your name, the nurse that's caring for you, the PSA or tech that's working with you, your physician's name, expected discharge date, and that would be if the doctor told, told us, you know, I think she'll be here for two days, we would write that date on there. The next section is my goal for today, and we typically will ask you, what do you want to accomplish today? And you may say, I want to walk more today. We'll put that up there. I usually joke around with my patients if I know that they're going home that day. When I first go in in the morning, I'll write escape today on there. So they find that kind of funny. Um, the bottom part is daily activities, and that's when therapy works with you. They'll actually make recommendations about um, how you get up. So Pam gets up with one person. She needs to use a wheeled walker. So anyone that comes in the room to help you, let's say, go to the restroom, would be able to quickly glance at that on the dry erase board and know how to help you. The bottom part is the most important part, <coughs> and that's where it says um, last pain medication given. We update that anytime we give you medication. The pain medicine is available as needed. It's not scheduled typically, so we keep this part updated continuously. And then it says when the next pain medicine is available. So if you forget, what time did I take those pain pills? You can quickly glance at that dry erase board and look at the clock and say, oh, I'm hurting. I think, you know, I'm gonna ask for more pain medicine. So that is updated continuously. So that's the communication board that we use. The restroom is kind of off to the corner over um, beside the bed there. And I think our next slide is a picture of the bathroom. It's got a walk-in shower, and then the commode is kind of off to the right here. Pretty fancy for a hospital bathroom. So once you get up to the unit, you'll be greeted and welcomed by the nurse and your patient support assistant or PSA. The PSA will check your vital signs, provide you with items that you will need during your stay. Typically, we start you out on clear liquids, so they may get you some ice chips, some ice water, to start out with, and as you recover from anesthetic, then um, we'll start bringing in more exciting things for you. Your nurse will assess you and your pain. We do this continuously throughout your stay. The communication board is that dry erase board um, that's on the closet in the room that we utilize quite often. Medications, anytime we give those, when you check in, you'll get an armband on and it's got like a little barcode. We scan that and then we'll scan the medication and scan the nurse that's actually giving it to you. And we do that for safety. So anytime we scan your armband, um, even someone bringing in your meal tray, we're gonna ask you to tell us your name and your birth date. And we do that, it's all for safety. So you will get tired of us asking, can you tell me your name and your birth date? So if you wanna see if your nurse is really on her, on her game, you can kind of change your birth date a little bit just to see if she catches you. Just kidding. So um, we will talk to you anytime we do medications. We'll talk to you about what the medication is, and then we also monitor for side effects. The nurse call light is on your TV control, which we give you, and it's a red button that you push, push for the nurse for help. 
There are nurse call lights that are on the bed rails on the side of the bed that are attached to the bed. Um, don't use those. Um, they are not hooked up. Use the one that's on your TV control. It's a big red button. We do bedside report up on the unit and what that is, the nurse that's going off duty will bring in the nurse that's going to be taking over your care and we'll introduce that nurse and say, this is Pam, she's going to be the nurse, she'll be with you until three. And we'll go over like a head to toe assessment with you. If we come in and you have friends or family there, we're going to ask um, your permission if it's okay for us to proceed with bedside report because of HIPAA with privacy. And if you've got friends and family in there, or let's say it's 11 o'clock at night and you're just getting ready to get settled down to go to sleep, you can ask us uh, to not do it in the room. But we like to do it in the room, that way we're all on the same page. So if you have questions or your family has questions, you know, we can address those at that time. Visiting hours, we don't really have any set visiting hours. Uh, we do ask if you have little ones that come to visit to please close the door to the room um, so it's quieter for the other patients. If you have a medical condition, um, high blood pressure, diabetes, COPD, something like that, the surgeon may consult a hospitalist, which is a medical doctor, and they would follow you medically for everything but the surgery, and then the surgeon would follow the surgery. We have two hospitalist groups here. Um, the first one is Central Ohio Primary Care. You may see it abbreviated on your board, COPC, and the other group is Med One. So you'll not only see the surgeon every day, you'll see the hospitalist as well. So they might be following blood sugars, that type of thing. We have these little foam hand sanitizers, and these are outside of each room and inside of each room. And anytime we go in the room, you'll see us using that white foam to um, sanitize our hands. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's critical that anyone entering or exiting your room washes their hands. And this is one of the things we do to reduce infection. So if you have friends or family coming, we encourage them to use that as well. And if you see someone coming in your room or exiting and you don't see them utilizing those practices, you know, don't hesitate to say, hey, do you mind using the hand sanitizer? There is a little sink um, where you can use, you know, regular water, soap, um, if you wish. We're going to go over some of the gadgets, I call them gadgets, that we use after surgery, and that's just so you know what they are. After surgery, when you come up, um, you may have oxygen tubing on, and this is as you're recovering from anesthetic. There's a little machine that's above the head of your bed, and it's this machine right here. It's called a pulse oximeter and it's hooked up to this little thing that goes on your finger and it uses an infrared light through your nail bed and it monitors your oxygen level and your pulse. And we have this on just for safety as you're recovering from anesthetic. So you know how ET had a green finger, you'll have a glowing red finger. And the ones we have upstairs um, are disposable, so it looks similar to the one I have down here. It just wraps around your finger like a Band-Aid. So that is the pulse oximetry. You may have a surgical drain, and this actually looks worse than it is. The purpose of this drain is if you were having a lot of bleeding after surgery, the surgeon may opt to put one of these in, and it's nice because it helps reduce the pressure and pain, um, and the blood goes in here, or the drainage goes in here, instead of staying you know, around your incision site. So this looks really kind of not nice. I always tell people it's a coach bag. It's just not very pretty. Um, so if you had one of these, um, the surgeon would place it in surgery. So it may be off to the side if you had back surgery off to the side of the incision. Some people don't have any. Um, some people may have one. Some people may have two. So you may have one off one side, one coming off the other. Um, if you have neck surgery, some patients do have a drain in too. It does serve a good purpose, but it is great when we get to take it out. I usually tell people it feels like you're laying on a garden hose. So it is a great thing when we get to take it out. We measure the output every eight hours. Um, the tech will come in. Usually this white part, the round part is flat, and we'll squeeze it and the drainage goes into this bag. So we report that every eight hours to the surgeon. As that number gets lower, the surgeon will say take it out. And that's happy day when that gets to come out. 
Another thing that we use, you may have these white surgical hose. These are called TED hose. And this helps um, the blood flow back up to the heart, helps prevent blood clots. So it's like a support hose. This is a thigh high version. We do have a knee high version that we use. And then this machine is a sequential compression device, or I call it leg squisher. This is typically on the foot of your bed. And then it's attached to these little wraps that go around your leg. I'm just gonna wrap it around my arm. And what it does, it kinda gives your legs a gentle massage, helps the blood flow up to the heart to help prevent blood clots. Most people love this. They ask if they can take it home. Um, so we utilize this while you're in bed. A third thing that we do to help prevent blood clots is uh, the doctor may order a medication called Lovenox. And that's a tiny little injection that we do in your belly once a day. And that's um, also to prevent blood clots. And we'll go over that a little bit later too. We talked about diagnostic labs and x-rays. Um, typically the surgeon will order a routine post-operative x-ray. Um, they order it the next morning after surgery, but if you're not quite feeling up to it or the doctor doesn't want you leaving the floor or whatever, uh, we may postpone it. As long as it's done before your discharge, that's okay. And then when you go to see the surgeon for your follow-up visit, about four to six weeks out, they may order another x-ray and they'll compare the hospital x-ray to the one that's further out. Lab work. Um, after surgery, sometimes they'll order lab work the next morning after surgery, and that would be that person that comes in from the lab in those bright red scrubs. Um, typically, lab is drawn early in the morning, like between four and six, and the reason for that, the surgeons, a lot of them make rounds early, so they like to have the results available um, when they come in to see you. We do frequent vital signs, uh, temperature, blood pressure, pulse, and neuro checks. And what neuro checks are, and you'll get used to us doing this, the nurse will come in and hold her fingers out and say, squeeze my fingers. Then they'll say, pull me towards you, or pull me towards your chest, push me back out. We're checking your muscle strengths and also asking if you have any numbness or tingling. Um, that's what we would do on your arms for your legs. If you're laying in bed or sitting in the chair, we put our hand on your knee and say, lift your knee up. Now lift the other one. We would put our hands underneath your feet um, if you're in bed or sitting in the chair and say, push down like you're pushing on the gas. Point your toes up towards your nose. We're checking your muscle strengths and we can quickly tell by just doing this four little test how you're doing if you're having any changes from surgery. So you'll get used to us coming, coming in and you'll kind of know the, the little dance that you have to do when we're checking that. Uh, bladder scanning, if you do have a catheter, a Foley catheter, that's that tube in your bladder, typically the surgeons will ask that we remove that by 6 a.m. the next morning after surgery. And the reason for that is we're trying to reduce your risk for infection. So if you have a catheter in, um, for ladies we put like a white plastic container in the commode um, that we would have you try to urinate in. For men, we would have you use a urinal, and then we'll get you back to bed after you've urinated and do a bladder scan. And what that is, it's like an ultrasound like they do on pregnant women. We're not looking for babies, you guys. Um, we're looking to see how much urine is left in your bladder after you've peed to make sure that you're emptying completely. You have to have three of those bladder scans, less than 200 cc's, and we'll say check, peeing okay. Blood sugar checks. That's um, when you're down in recovery, they may check your blood sugar where they just poke your finger for a drop of blood. If your blood sugar down in the recovery room or PACU is greater than 180, the surgeon will order that we check your blood sugars before meals and at bedtime. Um, if you're a known diabetic, they will order it that way. If you're not and we check it and you're high, we're gonna be checking them more frequently while you're here with us. And the reason why we do that is if your blood sugar is elevated and not in good control, it puts you more at risk for infection. So that's another one of the things that we do to reduce your risk for infection. Capnography is, um, it looks like oxygen tubing, but it's got a funny little duck bill that kind of goes over your mouth. And we use this if you have a pain pump, which is a patient controlled analgesia. It looks like it's an IV pump. I think it's coming up on one of my other slides. Looks like it's an IV pump where you can push a button 
and every 10 minutes give yourself pain medication. So if you have that pain pump, we'll be using that special oxygen tubing with the duck bill. It is kind of hard to eat or drink around that. You're kind of dodging the duck bill. So um, we get to take that off as soon as we discontinue the pain pump. Discharge criteria. Um, there's certain things that the doctors look for for discharge. There's a list and a little further in our presentation we'll show you uh, what those criteria are. If you do smoke, um, the doctor will generally discourage you from smoking or try to. Um, they probably have already had that conversation with you about nicotine replacement if they are okay with that. If they are, we do have um, nicotine patches that we can utilize if you know they order it. If you do smoke, it puts you more at risk for infection and it significantly delays your healing if you have a fusion. So post-op pain. Of course, after having surgery, pain is to be expected. Our goal is to manage the pain appropriately. And when we talk to you about pain, it's on a scale of zero to 10. Zero is no pain, 10 is the worst pain ever. And not only will we try medications, we'll try repositioning you. Uh, we may try ice packs, we may try um, like heat packs to try to get you more comfortable. As we had talked about before, pain medications are available on an as-needed basis. Um, they are not scheduled. So that's why we utilize that dry erase board, the communication board, and we'll keep checking with you to see how you're doing to try to make sure that you're as comfortable as we can, can get you. This is a picture of the pain pump that I was telling you about that's attached to a little button that you can give yourself pain medicine. Um, some of the surgeons Actually, most of the surgeons are not utilizing those as much. Uh, and the reason for that is, is you can only give yourself pain medicine every 10 minutes. And let's say you push the button and you fall asleep for about 30 or 40 minutes. It seems like you're, when you wake up, you're kind of chasing to catch up with the pain. So a lot of the doctors are kind of getting away from that. It is better, I will let you know, if we get you on pain pills because they tend to hold you better and last you longer. So initially, we'll start out using the IV pain medicine. That can be every three hours as needed. And then we'll try, once your stomach is recovered from the anesthetic, we'll switch you over to the pills. And the pills can ten tend to um, be one or two tablets every four hours as needed for pain. And our goal is we want to get you switched to the pills so that when the doctor says that you're ready for discharge, we know what's going to be OK for home. So. So we use those dry erase boards um, continuously when we do pain medications. We'll also try pillows and body positioning to help reduce your pain and promote comfort. So if you're laying on your back, we may put a pillow underneath your knees to take the pressure off your lower back, or we, we may turn you on your side, put a pillow between your legs, and maybe one behind your back and one to hang on to. Um, we may actually say, let's get up and go for a walk and it's the muscles tend to get really tight and when they do, that's when you're more prone to pain or spasms. So, um, you know, just know that once we say, let's get up and walk, we're not trying to be mean. A lot of people, we get them up and walk and they are much more comfortable moving. So we say the sooner we get you moving and grooving, you'll just feel better, do better. So activity after surgery, and this is, um, what we try to do while you're here, and also encourage this while you're at home, is to change your position about every hour. So if you're at home, after you sit in the chair for an hour, take a walk around your house. You can lay down for an hour or two, rest, get up, take a walk, sit in the chair. You're just going to feel better, do better, and your endurance uh, tends to come back more quickly. Typically, the only thing that the surgeon wants you to do after surgery is walking. So we just, you know, tell you no exercises until cleared by your surgeon. Um, you'll hear this phrase, no bending, lifting, twisting, and there's a 10 pound weight limit to lift. A gallon of milk is about eight and a half pounds. Initially, you might find that's even too heavy to lift that gallon of milk. Um, and limit stair climbing, you know, if possible, to avoid fatigue. We talked a lot about blood clot prevention already. So the, um, the TED hose, which are like the support hose, and the sequential compression devices, um, the Lovenox, which is that little uh, once a day tiny injection in your belly to prevent blood clots and walking. 
So typically our progression of activity is the evening of surgery, the surgeon may say that we want you to just sit up on the side of the bed. And if you feel up to it, we may try walking a little. If you feel up to it, we may try sitting you in the chair. And then the next morning, typically therapy gets involved to work with you. So pneumonia prevention. This is an incentive spirometer or Volurex, this little breathing machine. And um, we encourage you to use that because it helps expand your lungs, helps prevent pneumonia, helps you cough to clear secretions maybe from the anesthetic tube. So we tell you to do um, 10 sucks every hour uh, while you're awake, and that helps expand your lungs. We'll also offer um, a pneumonia vaccine if you're a smoker or if you haven't had one and you're interested in receiving one while you're here. And it's, um, if it's flu season, we will ask if you've had the flu vaccine and also offer that as well. So diet, when you first come up after surgery, you're on clear liquids. So it's ice chips, um, ice water. We have gourmet jello here. So you'll be on a clear liquid diet and we have room service here. So you'll get a menu that looks like this. And there's a number on here, it's 3663 or food. And you just use the hospital phone and you can order whatever you would like. This is the clear liquid diet, not very exciting. Um, and then as your stomach recovers from the anesthetic, then the doctor orders whatever diet they want you to have. So this is a regular diet, a lot more choices. If you're a diabetic, um, they'll have you on a special diet. If you've had neck surgery in the front, like an anterior cervical, the doctor will order a softer diet for you to make it easier for swallowing. So your diet will be advanced and tolerated as ordered, and it's important for your stomach to wake up after surgery before you eat anything. So we'll provide you with a menu consistent for your diet. The room service is available um, seven in the morning to seven at night by calling that 3663. Um, you have to order each meal and we can certainly help you order if you're not able to order. Please make sure that your bowels have moved well prior to surgery. The reason for this, the anesthetic and the pain medication, whether it's IV or pills, tends to slow down your bowels. And then diabetics, if you are a known diabetic or your sugars are higher than 180 in the recovery room, the surgeon will order that we check your blood sugars before you eat. So discharge planning begins when you first arrive at Riverside. We want to make sure you have the best possible outcome from your surgery and that you feel like your surgery is a success. The day of discharge, the surgeon may come in and see you and say you get to go home. If your surgeon happens to come early, like at 6 a.m., most of our discharges are between 11 and 2. We have two nurse practitioners that are up on the floor, and they're the ones that after talking with the surgeon will coordinate your discharge. So the nurse that has you that day will come in and review your discharge instructions and any prescriptions that the surgeon wants you to have for home. And an example of that would be usually one's pain medication, and sometimes they'll order a muscle relaxer. So we'll go over any of those medications with you. We'll talk to you about how to take care of your incision, um, activity do's and don'ts, and we always encourage you um, to make arrangements ahead of time for home support and also a ride home. So if you think that you're gonna be in the hospital for three days, it's kind of helpful to let your family or friends know, I'm gonna need you today sometime, you know, cause I get to go home. And like I said, most discharges are between 11 and two. So we like to try to have your ride here. And the reason for that, we have um, 32 rooms or 32 beds and they're private rooms. So when we are full, sometimes we're literally waiting to get someone up from surgery until we've had someone go home. So, um, you know, that just helps the patients that are, you know, having surgery so they get up to their rooms in a timely fashion. This is the steps to discharge slide and this is the checklist that the surgeon looks for to make sure that you're okay to go home and it's that you're eating and drinking okay you're not nauseated or vomiting we've stopped your IV fluids and your IV pain medicine and you're taking pills and they're they're working for you your temperature is less than 101 you're ambulating or walking three times a day 
that you're peeing okay and you're passing gas. Not necessary to have a bowel movement. We just want to make sure that you're passing gas and you're keeping food down and that you understand the discharge plan and then it's home. So some things to avoid are bending, lifting, and twisting. It is likely you will work with a physical and or occupational therapist while you're here to help determine any functional needs. So they'll actually come in, typically it's the morning after surgery and they'll go over, this is the right way to get out of bed, this is the wrong way. They'll try walking with you to see um, how you do with that. If you need any assistive devices after surgery, it's typically, um, we don't like to use canes or crutches after spine surgery. So if you did need something to help you walk, it's typically a walker with wheels on the front. If you have stairs to do at home to enter your home or your bedroom's on the second floor, that type of thing, they'll actually practice stairs with you to make sure that you're safe doing that. Go over restroom, bathing, dressing activities, spine precautions. If you have a back brace ordered or a neck collar, um, they'll go over how to get that on and off and when to wear it and any discharge planning and needs. Adaptive equipment. This is a kit that the occupational therapist will kind of bring in and show you and go over some of these items. Um, some of these may be helpful after surgery. This is a long-handled sponge and that helps to wash your legs, feet, and back. Um, this is a shoehorn and that helps if you don't have someone to help you get your shoes on. This is a reacher or a grabber. It's got like a little pincher thing on the end of it. And that helps with getting dressed and picking up items that you might have dropped on the floor. And then this is a sock aid. And that's if you don't have someone to help you get socks on. Um, I am not the most coordinated of people, but I can do it. So if I can do it, anyone can do it. Um, this comes in a kit um, that I believe they sell and the cost is about $26.50. If you feel that this would be helpful for you, you can let the therapist know and um, they will have it delivered to the room and they can bill you for it. The occupational therapist goes over all of these items and how to use them. So they'll go over some bathing and dressing activities with you and this will be discussed a little further in the presentation on some helpful hints for this. Some items after spine surgery that you may need is if you have access, and this is helpful if you ask friends or family, if they have a walker with two wheels in the front, if you needed some type of assistive device to help you after surgery, a raised toilet seat or a toilet seat extender, which you can purchase those at any drugstore, Walmart, um, Target, those kinds of places in the pharmacy section, a chair or bench for the tub or shower, a bedside commode, and then the reacher grabber thing. You may need some or none of these items, and it's just helpful if you can ask around if you've got friends that say, hey, I have this walker. If you need it, you can borrow it. So that way, you know, that saves you from having to purchase some of these things. Based on mobility, um, and some of these are out-of-pocket costs where the insurance may or may not cover. So safety, because of all of the gadgets that we have, uh, we always recommend that you avoid leaving the floor. Always discuss with your nurse prior to leaving the unit. And that's also too, so if the surgeon comes up to see you, we can let them know where you are. Use your nurse call light, and that's the red button on the TV control before getting out of bed. We don't want you to fall, like with gadgets on. And always ask your nurse any questions or concerns. There is a social worker on the floor that's available to help um, if you have any questions in regards to insurance coverage, when needed, can help to arrange any home health services, and that might be a therapist coming out to the house or a nurse just to check on you to make sure that you're progressing as, as the surgeon wants you to. Also help with any medical equipment, uh, a wheeled walker, toilet seat extender, that type of thing. If the therapist work with you and the surgeon feels that it would be better for you to get a little more rehab, they could help work with you and your family to coordinate uh, transfer to a rehab place to get a little more therapy. So when to call the surgeon's office, this is after you're discharged, is if you notice any new changes in sensation or weakness. And then we go over the signs and symptoms of infection with you. That's if you have any nausea, vomiting, chills, a fever greater than 101, 
If you notice any swelling, drainage, or redness at the incision site, we typically like to have friends or family see the incision while you're here. So that way they know what it looks like before you go home so they can quickly tell if, if there's a change. Um, they can let the surgeon know. It is very rare, but if the incision site would separate, you would definitely want to get in touch with the surgeon right away. That is rare. Increase in pain. So any of those, they would want to know about that. Call 911 if you have fainting, dizziness, difficulty breathing, chest pain not relieved by rest or medication. So we try to encourage you to do as much for yourself as possible. Um, of course, we'll help you with anything you need help with. But the sooner that we can get you more independent, you just feel better, do better. Plan for help at home after surgery. Do not assume you can go to a skilled nursing facility after discharge. Uh, there's insurance companies and Medicare. They have certain um, admission criteria that you have to meet in order to be able to enter those rehab facilities and have them cover it and your insurance plan will also influence um, admission criteria as well. If you have any questions after this class, um, we put this number up here. This is Christy Marshall. She's the nurse that's in the Depsy Family Learning Center. And um, you can call this number and leave a message for her. They do have a answering machine. So if it's after hours and you think of a question after class that you forgot to ask, you can call and Christy will call you back or I will call you back. Mr. Smith? Hello, my name is Kim. I am from physical therapy and the doctors wanted me to come and see you to kind of get you up. This is your first day after surgery and um, before your surgery you had a bunch of precautions, some things to avoid, so I'm here to kind of reinforce those things. And so um, do you recall what you are, those type of behaviors that you're supposed to be avoiding? Uh, some of them. Okay, it is the way to remember it is the acronym BLT. No bending, no lifting, no twisting. So you don't want to do any bending activity. You don't want to lift anything greater than 10 pounds and no twisting. So I'm going to kind of show you how to get in and out of bed and we're going to get up and take a walk and see how you do up on your feet and go through those precautions, okay? All right, how was your pain? Um, it's okay, not too bad okay. at this moment. Okay. But I think I do for some medicine. Okay. And we'll contact your nurse in regards Thank to you. that. Now, at home, do you have a flat bed at home? Yes. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to flatten your bed. I'm going to simulate your home environment. To take some of the pressure off of your back, you may want to bend your knees a little bit, okay? Sure. But I'm going to bring you down, okay? You ready? Yes. Okay, try to Sorry. bend your knees a little bit. Yes. There you go. And this knee, too. All right. Now we're going to get to the edge of the bed. To avoid that twisting motion, what you want to do is we want to roll to your side. It's called a log roll. Your shoulders and your hips are going to come at the same time. So we're going to roll towards me and we're going to do that on three. You ready? Yes. And we're going to roll. All right. Now you're going to work your legs over the edge of the bed there and you're just going to push up through your hand, then through your elbow and breathe out. Do not hold your breath. All right, and now what I'm going to have you do is just scoot forward for me towards the edge of the bed. Okay, how are we feeling? Any dizziness? Uh, a little bit lightheaded. Okay, we're going to let you sit here for a second. So that is how you're going to get out of bed without avoiding that twisting motion, okay? All right, and when we go back to bed, you're going to kind of do the opposite of how you got up. So you'll be going down to your side, make sure this hand is in front of you, lay down to your side, bring your legs up, and then roll to your back. Okay? All right. Looks like that dizziness is getting a little better. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and put your shoes on.
Okay, now we are going to stand. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, this is called a gate belt, it's a safety belt, and it's going to go right above your incision. And this is going to allow me to assist you if I need to, but also if you get a little weak or feel a little dizzy, I can help kind of control you, okay? And it's going to feel a little snug, but it loosens up as soon as you stand. Okay, now a part of getting up is you don't want to do that bending. There's a difference between bending at the waist to get up, but my back is straight versus you bent over. You don't want to bend over. So everything is going to go through your legs. So I'm going to have you scoot forward just a little bit. Okay, and we're going to stand. Keep your back straight. You can bend a little at your waist. Can I use my yes, hands? Yes, and you can use your hands. And we're going to stand nice and tall. Once we're standing, we're just going to stand there. Huh? You're doing great. All right. Any dizziness? No. No? Okay. All right. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take us a little walk. Now, while we're walking, you kind of let me know sure. if your pain increases. Now, before your surgery, were you having any pain down your legs at all? I just had the numbness on my left foot. How does it feel right now? It's better. Right? It's better? Yeah. So the surgery was... Sounds like it was a success. Yeah. How are we doing? It helps, yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to go to your right there. Huh? All right. You're doing a great job. Awesome job there. Okay. We're going to let you sit up on the chair for a little bit. Okay. Now, when you go to sit, we'll have you turn. Now we want to avoid the twisting motion. So you want to walk right in front of your chair and you're just going to step back until you feel it behind your legs. You're not going to turn to look behind you. And then you can reach back for the arms and lower yourself down. And I am going to put a pillow behind your back just to give you some support there. I'm going to have you scoot back as far as you can. There you go. Good job. I'm going to take your safety belt off of you. And that's wonderful. You did a great job there. Um, another thing um, in regards to your precautions, of course, you're going to kind of do that same activity when you go to the toilet, walk in front of the toilet. Step back until you feel it behind your legs and then proceed to sit down. Make sure you have some support for your hand. Uh, make sure you don't bend this way, but keep your back straight and lower yourself down. Okay? All right. And I want to show you how to get in and out of a car. We're going to kind of simulate that. Um, what you want to do to avoid that twisting motion is when you go to sit, I'm going to simulate like this is your car. You're going to back in, have a seat, and then bring both legs in. Okay, and then when you get out of the car, you're going to bring both of your legs out and then stand to sit up. So that avoids that twisting, no stepping in with one foot, no leading with your head. So those are the type of the movements that you're going to do when you get in and out of bed, you're walking, when we do the stairs, toileting, that's going to keep you from twisting and bending. Okay? I have a question. Yes. Mm -hmm. So any steps to, to get up? And now does your truck sit a little higher? Yeah. Do you have a running board or anything like that? Yes, okay, you can step back and step up onto your running board if it comes out well enough. If not, just a little stool to step back, up on it backwards, and then sit down and then get in. Okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, is there anything else I can get you before I leave? Uh, no, just the medicine. Okay, I will call for your nurse. With you sitting up right after surgery, you want to kind of limit your sitting to about like 45 minutes or so without getting up and moving a little bit. So you, do, you did well enough. If after about 45 minutes or so, if you want to just call the nurse, you can get up, take another little walk, maybe go into the bathroom, you can sit back down. Do you have a long ride home? About 45 minutes. Okay, so you should be fine um, going to your home. But what you want to do, if you have any, um, if you're in a car for any long extended period of time, after that, about 35 minutes, 40 minutes or so, you want to kind of get out, stretch your legs a little bit because you tend to get a lot of swelling in that area and you'll have a lot of discomfort. So you want to kind of keep moving every hour or so.
Oh. Okay. All righty. And I will call for your nurse and get you some pain medicine. Thank you so much. We'll be working with you. We'll work on some more things and just kind of go through those back precautions and answer any questions that you have. Okay, Mr. Great. Smith? Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, Mr. Smith, your nurse said you did quite well with that pain medicine and you feel a lot better. Yes. What we're going to do is I'm going to go over you getting back into the bed. I know we talked about it earlier, but I kind of want to go through the progression with you. Of course, I'm going to put my safety belt back on you, okay? And again, I'm going to keep it up above your incision. Now, this chair is a little deep. Um, it's always great to have back support. I'm going to have you scoot forward just a little bit before you stand. And remember, can you remember what you, those motions you're supposed to avoid doing? Yes, no okay. bending, no lifting, no twisting. Yes, sir. All Not right. More than 10 pounds. 10 pounds, right. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and stand. Remember to breathe out. Don't hold your breath. Great. Okay, we're going to step over to your bed there. And remember to turn and make sure you feel the bed behind you. And then reach back and lower yourself down there. And breathe. Don't hold your breath. pillow back there. Now we're going to do the opposite of how we got up. So you're going to do that, the opposite of the log roll. Yes, yep. And we're going to go down. Remember to keep this hand in front of you. Don't reach behind you so you don't twist your back. Bring this hand in front of you. Then breathe and bring your legs up. Take your shoes up. Yeah. There you go. Okay. And now roll to your back and breathe. Okay. And and I'll adjust your pillows there. There you go. Relax there. You need your head up a little bit? Uh, yes. Okay. Tell me how far to bring you up. This, I'm sorry. It's got one speed. <laughs> Good. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Is there anything else I can get you? No, thank you. Okay. Thank you All right. Let me get you your call light. your phone so if you need anything make sure you ring for the nurse okay all right you want your covers on uh, yes, just okay the just the sheet okay thank you very much thank you. all right thank you bye-bye hi how are you my name's Rachel I'm from occupational therapy are you Mr. Smith? Yes. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So my job here in the hospital is to kind of come in here, educate you on your precautions, make sure you can kind of get back to doing the things that you normally do on an everyday to day basis. So things like dressing, bathing, most of those good things you do every day. Okay? Have you received a spine education guide? Uh, not yet. Okay. So this kind of goes into your precautions. The main part we focus on is the physical activity section. Have you been seen by physical therapy yet today? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm sure Kim went over a little bit of that log roll for getting in and out of bed. That's on this page here. The focus, the ones I focus on is kind of dressing, toileting, anything in the bathroom such as bathing and grooming. And then this section here goes over into kind of your more IADLs, things you would do kind of in the community once you're leaving here. Okay, so these are the sections we'll be focusing on together. Oh. How's your pain today? Um, still having a little pain. Okay, you feel all right sitting here on the edge of the bed? I do. Okay, so what we'll do is we're going to sit here, and I'm going to see if you're able to bring your leg up to you. This is called a figure four position. Pain. Perfect. Are you able to take that sock on and off? Uh, yes. Okay. 
Great, so that's how I would want you to do is getting your socks on and off, kind of using that figure four position for your pants, underwear, and socks, okay? Um, also, at home, I don't know, do you have a shower chair or anything like that? I don't. You don't. So sometimes it's nice to have a shower chair to sit down on and either bring your leg up to you like that to kind of wash as well. Um, and then if you're unable to do that, then we have some equipment to show you that allows you to do those things while still adhering to your precautions. Okay, so I'll show you those things as well. So in this little kit, there comes a long handled shoehorn. There's a reacher. a long-handled sponge, and a sock aid. Have you ever seen anything like this? I, I haven't. Okay, so I'm going to kind of go over how you use each one of these equipment and kind of how you can use it to help get yourself dressed. So we'll start out simple. This long-handled sponge is helpful to get to your feet and to get to your backside. It helps to avoid any sort of bending that you would do or any sort of twisting when you're getting bathed. Okay? This is a reacher, and what it allows you to do is kind of get your socks on. It allows you to get your socks off, and then it also helps getting your pants on and off. So what you would do is you would kind of clip onto the side of your sock and then pull it all the way down. So I'm actually going to have you try doing that. Is that okay? Yeah. There you go. And you pull all the way straight down. Yep. You just got to get back behind that heel. So I'm going to have you take it all the way off, and then I'm going to show you a way that you can get your sock on. Okay? So this is a sock aid. What you do is you take your sock, and you're going to put it straight on the sock aid. So just like this. You want to make sure the heel is on the back of the sock aid and that the seam's lined up here because that's where your toes will be. Sure. Don't pull the sock up above the knobs here because it will get stuck and it will defeat the whole purpose. Oh. Okay? All you do is you fish down, stick your foot in, and then pull straight back. I'm going to have you try. Mm-hmm. And then just pull back and up towards your calf. Yep, and then you can drop the one side and you can pull the socket straight out. Do you want to take this off? Mm-hmm. You can just pull out on this side if you want. Do you know what I mean? There you go. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. So that's an easy way to help kind of get your socks on. This reacher is also good for getting pants on. So what you would do is you would take your pants and you're going to clip onto the side here. You'll bring the pants down and you'll kind of wiggle your one foot in and then once you kind of bring the pants up to here, you'll clip on to the other side of the pants and then you'll bring it straight back down, put your other foot in, pull up and then once they're kind of at your arm length, you're able to pull them up the rest of the way and then stand to get them pulled. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. What type of shoes do you wear at home? Mm-hmm. Do you wear slip-on shoes or tennis shoes? Mm, slip-on shoes. Slip-on shoes? Okay. So if you're using slip-on shoes at home, you may not really need this, but this is a long-handled shoehorn. If you were to wear tennis shoes at home, it's really nice for you to kind of put this behind your heel so that the heel doesn't get stuck. Also, what you can do is you can take the reacher and you can hold the tongue up so that way that doesn't get stuck as well. And since you're unable to be bending forward, elastic shoelaces are helpful instead of having to bend forward to tie your shoes. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Also, another few things we look at is toileting. So since you're unable to twist back to clean yourself up after a bowel movement, 
There's something called toileting tongs, and you can use that to kind of help extend your reach, and also disposable wipes are helpful to minimize the, the amounts of times that you're wiping. So um, also, if you're able to, you can kind of squat and reach forward. But if you're unable to do that, the toileting tongs are super helpful. Okay. And then um, I'm going to see kind of how well you're doing up and moving, and then make sure that um, you're doing well as far as in the bathroom, kind of getting on and off of the toilet, and then standing at the sink to be brushing your teeth. Okay. Did you want to put your shoes on, kind of using uh, that yes. figure four position? Yeah. Okay. There you go. Good. And then we'll do the other side. All right. I'm going to put this safety belt around you, okay? All right. I'm going to keep it up high, okay? Get off that incision. Okay, when you're ready, I'll have you stand up. You may need to scoot to the edge of the bed, kind of far back right now. Okay, you ready to stand? Good job. Make sure you're breathing. Try not to hold your breath. And then just be careful of those items on the floor. Not feeling dizzy or lightheaded. So what we're going to do is we're going to head into the bathroom. So what I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you step right in front of the toilet and I want to see how well you're getting kind of on and off of the toilet. So I'll have you come straight up and then I want you to use that grab bar if you need it, okay? Okay. And then slowly lower yourself down. And breathe out. Great job. All right, and then when we're getting up off the toilet, I'm gonna also have you hold on to the grab bar, and then we'll just stand right up. Good, I'm gonna have you come up to the sink. So one of your precautions is to avoid bending forward. So when you're brushing your teeth, I'll have you stand right up here. So anytime you're brushing your teeth, you want to make sure you don't bend at your back. You want to make sure you're kind of bending at your hips if you're bending to spit into the sink after brushing your teeth. Yeah. If you're unable to do that, I would recommend using a cup to spit into. Okay. You gotta make your try. If you would like to, you're more than welcome to. Mm-hmm. Also at home, I don't know if you have a family member that can put most of your commonly used items that you use in your bathroom countertop level to avoid any sort of bending that you would have to do to get anything out from underneath the sink. Yeah, I do have some more. Perfect. I would also recommend doing the same thing in the kitchen. And then here's a cup for water if you need it. So remember, just bend at your waist. Try not to bend at your back, okay? So try to keep that as straight as you can. 
And then like I said, if that's difficult for you, just bring that cup up to you and you can spit inside that. I didn't know if you needed a towel. There you go. Mm -hmm. Would you like to be up in the chair or back in bed? Uh, back in bed. Okay. So I'm having pain. Yeah, that's fine. I can toss that. Thank you. What, what number would you give your pain right now on a scale um, of 1 to 10? Between 7 and 8. Okay. I'll let your nurse know.